to remember it before we get started. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you for having me. Um, I am so honored and excited to be here. You did not have to read all of that. I was trying to give you a whole thing, but um, <laughs> so I, before I start, I also want to introduce a colleague who's here to help me out with the Zoom and all of that. Shay, um, I know I saw you earlier. So if you want to also introduce yourself, I guess so people know. I am right here. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. My name is Shay Mitchell. Um, as Tabitha said, the wonderful Dr. Tabitha said, I am assisting her today. Um, so I'm here, but I'm not really here, but I'm so excited to be here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Shay. Okay, so we only have 90 minutes, and I say only, but that's probably a lot for all of you to take the time and pause everything to be here. So for everybody who feels comfortable to be on camera, this would it would be lovely to see everybody's faces. This being self-care, this being about collective care. Um, obviously, everybody has reasons why, why they are not on camera, but if it's possible for you, that would be really helpful that we see each other's faces, that we pause everything and show up for ourselves, which we don't get to do as much in our day-to-day -day lives. So anybody who feels comfortable and those who are already welcome and good to see your faces and those who are not able and that's okay too. All right. So for today, I want to kind of give you an overview of what we're thinking about. I want this to be more in my brain. We're all sitting around a circle. We're in the same room and I'm seeing your names and faces. So I'm pretending like I'm with you all in one room, virtual or not. And so if possible to kind of really ground ourselves. It's going to be um, in a way that we are here to show up for ourselves. We're not going to put on the brain of learning of what can I do with clients? What can I, how can I take these skills to somebody else? This is for you and you alone. So you get to be selfish today. You get to pause being a mom, being a sister, being a caretaker. It's just for you. Okay. So and then with that in mind, I want to know who's in the room. Uh, maybe through the chat, that might be faster to just throw in name, maybe how you show up in this work. I'm not sure if everybody is in the same sector um, and what part of, I assume everybody's in New York, but maybe you're somewhere else, maybe somewhere more exciting. So where you're sitting right now and what your position or your role that you do. Um, and so that we can kind of get to know each other. And the interpreters, please feel free to tap me if I get too excited and start talking really fast so I can slow it down. So I'm going to try to stay mindful of the interpretation, but sometimes that um, happens. All right. Okay, so welcome. So I wanted to open it up by just sharing a little bit about myself and knowing that we are Today, most of you have connections with migrant workers. And how do I show up in this work? Who am I outside of some of the things that Asli has, has read? But how I'm connected to this experience of the people you work with. Um, so I'm um, Dr. Tabitha Mamira, finally. That's done. That part of the, the journey is over. Um, but I've been a mental health therapist for over coming to 15 years now. And I am originally from uh, Rwanda, but I grew up in Uganda as a refugee uh, since I was little. And I did not know I was a refugee. I thought that was home. Um, and during that time, some of you who might be familiar with the Rwandan genocide, that was why we ended up, the world knew about 94, but really it started in the 50s. And great grandparents would go back and forth, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. So any part of the world you're in, you might find a Rwandan somewhere. <laughs> that is why we, we are everywhere. And so growing up there until 1994, when the bigger uh, part of the genocide happened, that's when we started hearing more about my parents talking about returning home, um, getting made fun of by students, telling us we're taking up their resources and in schools. And I was very confused because I thought this was home. I just thought Rwandans are another tribe in Uganda. And for the first time, I knew why I didn't feel like I belonged. And so right at the end of the war, literally August, around November of 1994, 
my mom decides we're moving back. So now we moved back to Rwanda right at the end of the genocide. Things are still upside down. And um, Rwanda was a French country. I'm coming from an English country. So we just, nobody speaks the language we learned. So we're just thrown in a classroom, all this English speaking kids from first grade to 10th grade, it didn't even matter. Um, and then I also speak Luganda. <laughs> they were speaking Kinyaranda. So now I thought we're finally home and now I'm with my people and they are calling me Ugandan and I have an accent. And so things did not settle fast enough. And in 1999, I were able to come to the United States. And so I get to the US and now I'm black which was never an identity. I thought as an identity because everybody around me was black. It was just who you are. And, but in the black community, I'm African. In African community, I'm Rwandan. In the Rwandan community, I'm Ugandan. So there's always been that, okay, then where do I belong? Who am I? And so why do I say this? Is to kind of bring us back to some people with lived experience doing work with those who are going through something they've gone through you don't even realize how much of those triggers or that trauma that is also called back up when you're starting to do this work. So I want us to really ground ourselves in what our experiences when we're doing the work that we do, our personal ones, the ones we hear and how we connect with that and how it impacts us. And then what can we do to consistently show up for ourselves, right? That, um, that analogy of the mask that you put on your own mask before somebody else. I want us to change that a little bit and say, how do we get to a place that we don't even need a mask in the first place? That we don't wait till we're in crisis to do self-care. And what is self-care, right? So those are kinds of the reasons and the, the hows and the whys we're going to do these two sessions together. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about my story and how that shows up for me. And so a really quick exercise. Um, take 10 seconds and think about the first top five people who are most important in your life that if they called you right now and something happened you would log off you would run you do whatever it takes to show up for them it can be in it doesn't have to be all inclusive some of us have more than five people that we could do that for maybe you can say parents siblings whatever um but just quickly five people all right for those I can see, you can give me a thumbs up if you feel like you got them. Awesome. And then those I can't see, feel free. This is going to be very much um, inclusive. I want us to have conversations and all of that. So you can use good old, yes, reactions. There you go. We got it. Okay. So did any of you include yourselves on that top five? If if you if your name showed up on your top five, can you put a hand up? Even if I can't see you, just using the reactions. Kathleen, wonder why? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, I like the thumbs down too. Daisy, you did too. Awesome. Okay, so we have two people who included themselves on that top five list. That you will drop everything if you need to show up for yourself. And the rest did not. Those who did, Daisy and Kathleen, if you feel comfortable, can you share what, how you got to that place that you are on, on your top five people you show up for? Only if you're comfortable. Oh, you're muted, Kathleen. I misunderstood your question. I actually didn't show up in my top five. So sorry. So it's only Daisy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I did the same. I was not in my top five. I was like, wait, no, no, wrong. You are not. Okay. <laughs> but now I know I should probably include myself in that. Probably. probably. <laughs> That's where we're going with this, right? So this is the first uh, round of showing up for ourselves, where we will be number one on that list because the rest of them cannot get the best of you if you are not on that list. You will have nothing to offer unless you are on that list, right? So we're starting there. How do we show up for us? And why are we not on that list, right? So those are some of the questions we're gonna be going through uh, with this. So this being a self-care, collective care, wellness um, workshop, organizing, gathering, however we wanna call it, it's very important that we agree on how we wanna show up in this space and that we make sure everybody um, is 
respected, taken care of, that we understand. So I'm going to take a couple seconds to go over agreements before we really dive in. And I have a few that I already put here, but obviously each one of us have different needs and different ways uh, that would make today, the next hour or so helpful. So the one is confidentiality. If anybody gets to share something um, to that it stays in this room, something personal. And you can always share about your own experience in the room, but not somebody's story without their permission. The sharing time takes space, makes space. Um, some of us are talkers, some of us, uh, we tend to sit back and watch. So for wherever you are on that spectrum to try to kind of push yourself to say more or less, depending on what comes easier for you, using I statements that we, we cannot um, express other people's opinions. It, whatever I am saying in the room is about me by me. Respect, the respect can look very different culturally, it can look differently individually so what does that look like for you um and space for complexity that sometimes my experience does not uh, align with yours how we see the world and the other piece around that is especially um when trauma is involved in some of the things you all hear and the experiences either been through or support others through there is complexity, their triggers, right? So there is something that I think I'm saying. There's always three conversations going on. Something I think I'm saying, something you are hearing, and what's actually being said. And sometimes those are all completely different things, even if the words are exactly the same, because we are all using our own lenses. So taking space for that complexity of what I'm hearing and what they're saying, there's intention and there's impact. Um, so there's that. In the dynamic humanizing flow, right? We're all humans. So some we're going to come in with different intentions. Maybe some people are here thinking, I'm going to get some skills and I'm going to be the best self-care guru after this. And some people are like, oh, I just want to show up and see what happens. And some people have a rigid um, idea of what this should be. It shouldn't be. And we're going to do a dance of what's in the room, what's needed. So kind of making that flexibility that we allow for what's in the room to happen. Um, sp space to connect with our own inner knowing, um, prioritizing self-care. That could look like just staying off video for those who are going to the bathroom when you need to, even if I'm talking, all of that. Okay, so those are the key ones for me, but I'm going to make space for anybody who has something else. Is there something I'm missing that will make this next hour a little bit more um, interesting helpful respectful okay and you can throw it in the chat anytime you think of one or if something happens that makes you feel like you're not getting what you need out of this and as we're doing that too taking this moment to check in with yourself what was my intention for coming here what's my why right somebody made me um i need to feel out something oh i really am curious about self-care I want to learn something. What's my intention? What's my why? Because when we know why we're here, we're more likely to engage in that way. All right. And that's for your own grounding. Okay. So now I'm through all the um, all the logistics and all of that. Um, so we're going to jump in quickly. I understand everybody comes, some people I see are coming in from legal services, others. So I want to make sure we're all understanding when I'm using some of this language. Um, what am I saying? What does that mean? So I will do a little bit of that. That might sound lectury. I apologize, but it's important that we are all on the same page. But also then we'll be sprinkling in a little bit of um, the tools. Okay, so... Ansley, do you mind making Shay co-host so she can make our groups? Thank you. All right. So real quick, um, and one of the reasons I was sharing kind of how I come to this work in my background, I want you all to not think about a pink elephant in this moment. I don't want you to think about a pink elephant. So the more I say pink elephant, how many of you are successful at not thinking about a pink elephant? Who? 
has anybody ever seen a pink elephant before? <laughs> right? No. <laughs> right? So that's if, as soon as something is said, the brain right away has to create and, and, and um, close that loop. And so even when we know we're here to do self-care, but we're talking about immigrant experience or however you show up in this work, the brain is picking up cues on what is being said. So we get triggered if something is too close to us and or sometimes we're not even realizing the part of the brain is trying to do all the uh, some of the pieces that we're going to talk about, the fight, flight, freeze, and that shows up for us in different ways. So even as soon as something is in the room, this, the fact that it's pink elephant, um, I had a client who was a, a survivor of a, a genocide of a war and then got a scholarship to come to the U.S. to play basketball and got into college. And he thought he is on a way to healing and better things, but never went to therapy, never worked through some of the things that they experienced. And every time he'll sit in class, not even five minutes in, he runs out in a full on panic attack and just never knew what the heck is going on. He really wanted to learn. He really wanted to show up for himself, but something would always happen. And eventually somebody told him, have you thought about seeing a therapist? And he did. As finally, when he did, they started realizing, what are your triggers, right? Some, some triggers we think of regular things that are um, clearly disturbing or activating. But it turned out for this young man, um, by, by the time I saw him, he had already figured this piece out, but this is his background was the clock. Every time the clock on the wall was tick tock, it made a sound that was similar to a sound of water dripping on leaf where he was hiding. And in a hundred years, he would never have known that a clock in the classroom is the reason he can sit there and learn, right? So part of doing this work for us is also to notice and realize what are some of the things in my environment? What are some of the things in the people I support in their environments that kind of can trigger us without even noticing we're being triggered? So when we say pink, don't think of a pink elephant, whether or not it's conscious, the brain keeps track of all the things that might be harmful to us. That could be a scent, right? And it uses five senses. The brain always uses senses to remember. Um, so because we internalize trauma through our senses, we also get triggered through our senses. And we can also ground and heal ourselves through our senses. So the way in is the way out. So the first tool I'm going to give you all before we we jump into more, more things is using our five senses to ground ourselves before we start. We probably um, all have had a few, some people not had their coffee yet or a lot of emails already. Some of you have already been on the computer for five hours before the world wakes up. So we all co we're coming in from different stressors, different activities. So we're gonna use our five senses. This is the first tool, all right? that you can always do anywhere and nobody has to know you're doing it. But as soon as you're triggered, because we're triggered through senses, we can also ground through senses. And, and some of this might be very familiar to some of you who are coming in through the mental health uh, world. So just bear with me and I'll go along, right? We can, all, we can all ground ourselves at any time. So how do we do that? We start by, we all know we have five senses. So we're gonna start by something you can see. So I want you to take a little time and identify five things you can see in front of you and really see it. That could be my computer, like seeing color and texture and the pen, club. All right, everybody found five things they can see. Good. All right, looks like Daisy's still looking around. We'll give you some time. Good. <laughs> and now four things you can touch. And I want you to actually touch it. Um, this is warm, my coffee, different textures, temperature, actually touch them. Yeah, good. And three things you can hear. Maybe my voice, I have a heater going. I live in Michigan, y'all, it's already cold. 
um, three things. Okay. Now, two things you can smell. And that can be something you make yourself smell. Um, I always keep a little lotion nearby. Well, maybe a cup of coffee or tea. Yeah, there you go. And last but not least, one thing we're not always eating. So instead of taste, we're going to say feel. What are you feeling after that exercise? And if you feel comfortable, throw it in the chat. What what is what feeling came up for you after noticing and being present? Calm. Distracted, yeah. Cold. I'm always cold, Miguel. Me too. <laughs> See? Present. It brings you back in this present moment. Whatever the feeling is, it's not to judge it, not to change it. It's like, where am I? What's going on? But the other key about this, neutral, the key to this too, is the brain cannot do two conflicting things. So when we're making our to-do list, when we're having an anxious moment, when we're thinking about what we didn't do, what we need to do, and take the time to do that, hear, feel, think, it literally will stop that loop. It'll pick it up again, right? Because that's what it does but it will stop and interrupt and bring you back in the present moment. And the nervous system will switch instantly just by doing that. So when you find yourself in this room kind of doing that, the brain goes away or it thinks of this, or you open that, you can do that and come right back in the room. Yeah. So that's an, one way we can interrupt and disrupt in any moment. Um, you're having a fight with a partner, kids, whatever it is, taking that moment will reset. That's your free reset. Another free reset is breath. Breath reminds the brain that I am okay. I am here, right? Taking that deep breath. All right. Okay, so anybody has anything to add, say, contributes? Okay. Anytime you do, please just unmute and go on. All right, so now we're gonna do another quick exercise, but this time we're gonna break out into rooms. Um, and this piece is what, we'll talk more about it after you return, but I'll just give you the directions now. So you, Shay's gonna break you up into two rooms of two people. You are gonna have a partner. Once you get in the room, I want you to, one of you is gonna be person A, You'll agree on who's person A. One of you will be person B. And so person A is going to go first. So if you already think that's me, um, or both of you can listen to this and then decide in the room. You're going to think about what was one of the happiest moments in your life. The thing you can think of and without even trying, you start smiling. Maybe it's like, the moment you had your child or your first kiss or marriage or your job or whatever that is for you. I want you to think of the happiest moment in your life that you've ever experienced or the funniest joke you've ever heard um, and bring that to mind. That's person A. And once you bring it to mind, I want you to smile and laugh as if it's happening in that moment. I want you to really embody that moment as you think of it. And then person B, I want you to have the most neutral face you've ever had in your whole life. Like you do not smile, you do not respond. Person A can choose or not to or not to share why they're smiling. It can be total silence. All they have to do is smile and laugh. Whatever that happy emotion comes up for them. And person B, you do nothing. All right. Does that sound clear? Okay. I think, is it fully closed now? I, everybody's back. I don't want to miss anyone. Everyone is. All right. Anybody wanting to share a little bit of how their experience was? How many of you are able to keep a straight face while the other person either shared about what brings them joy or what makes them smile? How many people were able to keep a straight face? Those okay, we got Wendy and Karen. 
and that nobody else was able to. <laughs> okay. How was that experience? If if anybody's open to unmute yeah. to share. I see I'm mu unmuted, so I'll just say it was really nice um, to meet Araceli, my partner, but also, um, and so it was hard to get into the activity because we wanted to get to know each other. <laughs> Were you able to get to it, to the activity, or at least one of you? Kind of, sort of, yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, for right? So getting to know somebody else. It was hard to keep it neutral. It was pleasant. Um, I think Kathleen, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a little different for us because my partner was in a very busy office. So we couldn't really, <laughs> she couldn't go on camera. So the, the facial expression, we couldn't really share. But I think one thing that came up for my partner mentioned, and I, um, I also feel it for me. So I guess I'm saying it for me is that sometimes thinking of the happiest moment um, can almost be a trigger because you compare it with the moment you're in. Mm. Um, mm. So it's interesting. It's kind of a double-edged sword thinking about it. That's a really good point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Anybody else had a different experience, right? And that's beautiful to see how everyone was showing up to it. There's no one way. But, okay. All right, so I'll just jump in. Um, oh, I have some chats here. Funny, but we're able to do it eternally. <laughs> no. um, some partnerships created, relationships created in five minutes. Isn't that beautiful? Um, Surprised me because I thought I knew what memory I was going to share, but then another memory came out instead. So you were surprised by how many happy ones you have, <laughs> right? Wonderful. See how everybody's brain went in different places. But the actual reason for this uh, on my end, the intention for the exercise, and usually works better, obviously, in person, like many things, but uh, we, stay, we, we stay flexible, is that we all have these neuro mirroring neurons that whether or not you acknowledge how we impact each other. I didn't share mine with Daisy was my partner and I didn't say why I just started laughing and she started <laughs> cracking up and she doesn't, she still doesn't know why my, what, what my happy memory was. Um, but if you notice that you're around positive energy or negative or stress or anxiety, whether or not that's your experience, you're mirroring neurons. We are a communal people. We are created, made to live in community and to read signs of what's around us as a survival skill. So whether or not we acknowledge it or know it, we impact each other. And so if you see kids who grow up in maybe abusive homes, whether or not this was like a very positive kid growing up around that kind of fear and anxiety of what's going to happen next changes how they show up their own stress levels. And we know a little bit about more research being done on uh, epigenetics, that when a mother is stressed out and is pregnant, you transfer that those trauma uh, into the DNA of the child. Evolutionarily speaking, is so that this child can come into a world prepared to survive in it. So that DNA is there to inform this new being in the world of, we're getting into a stressful world. So whether or not the mother is no longer in that situation, the child is already uh, pre-programmed to survive in that kind of environment. So anyway, um, usually in a full room of people just hearing laughter left and right, and nobody knows why anyone is laughing, is that in this work, whether or not you're having the best day of your life and you are dealing with people who have gone through so much pain, who are currently going through it. I don't know how everybody else's work is. Whether you like it or not, those mirroring neurons are picking up what's going on for them. It's picking up their trauma. And most of the time we're sending them to get these resources of healing. We're sending them to get therapy and we don't realize we're holding half as much, if not more, just from sitting in the same room with them. 
just from hearing those story, difficult stories, let alone our own experiences. And so that was to show how good or bad we are always mirroring each other. And so when we care for ourselves, we're actually caring for our community, right? So that's why self-care is also collective care. So that when I sit across Karen and I'm all here, calm, grounded, and Karen is really stressed, eventually one of us, whoever's, is gonna ground the other, right? Or the other way around. So when we think of this as being selfish, we're actually taking care of everybody else around us by taking care of ourselves. So when we think about that, <laughs> you like that, Karen, right? <laughs> I like the energy, right? So when we care for ourselves, when you take that moment, that hour and step away, and think of it as how many people are going to gain from you stepping away, it kind of reframes the importance of that is for us. And then from what you mentioned, Kathleen, that sometimes maybe thinking about those happy moments also trigger the bad moments. And how are we reframing what that means, right? Also makes a difference is that they both happen. If you're alive long enough, we will never only experience one thing. So kind of another reminder of each one ends. The, the good ends, the bad also ends. And they all coexist. But when we're in this moment, in this present moment, we kind of also have agency to decide and pick and choose. So speaking of agency, we're going to do another. I'll do a, another tool. But before I go into it, I feel like I've been kind of throwing in all this, some of the terminology I've been careful not to, but it shows up. So I want to take a quick moment and do a little bit of a lecture -y thing, which is something I don't enjoy too much um, during these kinds of workshops. But it's also important because I don't, we don't want to take for granted that everybody understands what it is when I say trauma and triggers and um, activated nervous system and the brain, all that fun stuff that we're not taking it for granted. So we're going to do a quick it feels like class, but maybe I'm projecting. Um, so I will start with quick terminology of when I'm saying these things, what do I mean? And this will set us up for next session of what are, um, I'm not sharing, am I? Nope. I'm not. Like when I say some of these things, for, for those of you that this is too familiar, just, um, excuse me, um, hang in there with us, maybe throw in some things in the chat that how this might mean different, uh, you come at it from a different angle, whatever comes up for you, if I'm if this is too familiar for you, that it feels boring, but I will make it really quick. It's just really important that everybody uh, knows that we're, what, what are we talking about, right? So trauma, that's an experience with lasting adverse effects on a person's physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual being. The word trauma itself is actually from the uh, wound, the word wound um, in Greek. And so that's an emotional wound. And now it's become, everybody uses this word with when they're uncomfortable, any discomfort or any stressor, anything that doesn't make me feel good. More people, more and more people are saying, oh, I've been traumatized by how my mom took away my phone. Like, no, <laughs> that is not trauma, right? So I think we hear a lot, a, a lot of people misusing this, but this is really an emotional one. And from a DSM point of view, it's an experience where you witness or you experience uh, close to death, injury, and where it feels like your life could have ended or somebody else's I care about. So it is much bigger, right? So there's stress, all things are on a spectrum. But when we say the word trauma, that is actually a little bit more. Um, and then PTSD, obviously, that's the diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder. That's the diagnosis that if specific symptoms are met, we give that. And then you got secondary traumatic stress. Those are the emotional duress when exposed to another person's trauma. So some of you probably um, experience this a lot while you're going through um, working with immigrants or refugees or any kind of group that has uh, experienced oppression, wars, all events that are traumatic. Um, 
And a few people refer to it as compassion fatigue, where you're constantly hearing difficult stories, showing up for people. Um, so when I say vicarious trauma, that is more of for a lot of helping professionals uh, with survivor with trauma survivors. That is where we are also starting to inherit. Well, inherit is where we're, up, we're internalizing what um, the traumatic events we're hearing. And we start seeing people showing exactly similar symptoms to the person, even though they have never experienced anything like that for themselves. Um, and so you start changing your beliefs and feelings and loss of meaning, hope, all things that happen for the actual survivors. And these two, um, some people use them interchangeably, but there is a little bit of a difference. The vicarious trauma, you almost similarly um, show the same symptoms as the survivor themselves. And then moral injury. This is a little newer in the uh, literature departments, but that is a damage done to one's conscious or moral compass when something goes wrong. Either they perpetrate or witness something that they didn't do anything about, um, or they feel like they failed to prevent something, um, or their own moral beliefs, values, or ethical codes. So sometimes if we're supporting survivors in really difficult situations and something terrible happens to them. So like in my world, if a client were to um, die by suicide and I was the therapist, that could create more injury. Like, what did I miss? How could I have prevented it? Even though law up here, we know that most of the time, none of us can prevent some of these things, but because you're in it and you have connection to this person, that's what we mean by moral injury. Um, and this shows up a lot, but we didn't have language for it for a long time where then people start blaming themselves in a really um, intense way. In that some of the reactions, um, and as I'm going through these, maybe check in for yourself. Uh, any of this shows up for you in your work. Compassion fatigue, just being exhausted, can't do more. Um, but then again, you say, of course, I'll do overtime because work continues. People need your help. Um, there's the guilt of I should have done more and there's always more to be done. There's... In, in the US now, in the, in this space, like uh, Daisy was just sharing, almost every other day, a new group comes in and new people need help. Um, so that guilt does not go away. And then when you put boundaries on, you're not able to, there's a shame, right? And shame and guilt, the difference is guilt is I did something bad and shame is I am bad. So there's that, like, I feel bad that I didn't do more. And that's a feeling it's outside of me. When it graduates into shame, then it's like, I'm a bad person for not doing more. And most of the time, that's where people really, that's stickier to tease apart when you think it, it's something to do with who you are versus something you can do or change. Um, so there's there's that. Those are some of the common reactions around moral injury, but also um, some of the second the secondary trauma, right? So looking at this, when we, our own experiences and the people we serve, when we're in a room together, even right now in this room together, it's like a trauma soup. We all, in our brains and minds and bodies, we all have a million things going on at the same time. There is their trauma, the person I am supporting. There's our trauma, my own, what I've gone through, some of my triggers are showing up. Vicarious trauma that I'm holding from many, many people I've survived, uh, that I've supported. Moral injuries, compassion fatigue, guilt and shame, drowning in this, right? Um, that all of it could be present for us at the same exact time. So what does that mean? Or before we get, jump into what does that mean? I know I went through that really fast and for some people it might be the first time, for others it might be like, yeah, 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 let's move on. Any questions, comments, where you've seen this show up in your own work? Um, I just, 
and I'm a therapist, I'm very comfortable with silence. So I will give it a few, three minutes. <laughs> Some people need time to gather their thoughts and others are like, oh no, it's too quiet. So I am going to give a couple of minutes to see if anybody either comments, questions, they're on any experience they want to share, somebody they've seen, whatever's coming up for you. And yeah, before we move forward. Oh, in the chat too, for those who are in a busy space, if I want to keep in mind of that too. All right. You want to say more about compassion fatigue, Christos? Um, I would say that it's a lot. Um, having, like you said, having to deal with um, certain um, demographics, um, whether it's the demographics or um, mental status of, um, you know, people that actually live here that need our help, as opposed to people that are actually coming in that need our help. It's a lot and it's it it, it, it bears a lot of weight. I know for me it does. I, I try to help as much as much as I possibly can. Um, even people that call here um, at my agency and I cannot help them, I still try to help them. You know, it's only right in our positions because nobody else is doing it. So it does it does weigh and as much as we can say, oh, you know, this is the this is the job, this is what comes with it. We cannot shake this off, you know, when we go home. I know that I cannot. I actually see a therapist to get through. So I can mentally, you know, I can maintain my mental with my family. My family does not work here. I do, you know, and to take that to them or to take even family traumas, you know, here, that's that's difficult too. You know, it's difficult to turn it off and on. And self-care, it's it's just, it's it's very pertinent, you know, to try to combat the compassion for you, for yourself and for others. Just people need that grace with one another. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And I'm so glad you're, you're getting that support for yourself because um, it is key. You are holding a lot. And I think um, somebody... Wendy or Victoria, I don't know if you wanted to say more about your comments. It's nice to know there's a name. Yes, that, that validates, right? It's like, oh, it's not me. This is a thing. Other people experience this. Anybody else? I, I wouldn't say like it's it's directly about trauma but um I, I do feel like there's like a correlation when it comes to like dif difficult circumstances like for instance I worked through the pandemic I, I was on the front lines and so I what I found is I, I think that period of isolation like setting and and what's going on in the world also can be super triggering and I found that when people would be coming in it was like and and you can't be mad. It's some. It's like you want to be frustrated, but then people are unloading their frustrations like onto you. So it was just like we're we're the frontline workers, and we're here, and we're all collectively stressed about this major event that's happening in the world. But then, I don't know. It's, you you have a lot of people just kind of putting everything on you, and I guess that kind of triggers things in in yourself as as well. You know, but that that kind of was my experience um, during the pandemic. But then I think um, um, as the speaker before was talking about, like finding those tools to help yourself to navigate these difficult um, triggers or difficult circumstances. I found out during that time that I can actually write poetry and I had no idea prior to the pandemic that I could do that. And then I'm like, oh, OK, keep on speaking, girl. I'm going to speak easy. I'm doing all these things. And I'm like, oh, you're actually pretty good. And that was kind of like my little outlet, my medium. So it's just, it's interesting where we find our happy places, even from very difficult circumstances. You know, mm -hmm. so, Thanks for sharing. Yes, find, staying creative in how to care for ourselves. There's no one way. And oh, thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Yes, Karen. And yeah, you can use the hand as well. Thank you for that reminder. Go ahead. Yeah, so... Well, I'm so happy that this is be taking place because we've been seeing the compassion fatigue moved into resentment, which mm -hmm. means that we are now like we're here to help or we're not because we're resenting the fact that you're here because we're we're burnt out and overwhelmed. 
And it's just like this whole, like, like I wish. And that's why I'm so glad that this is here. So maybe we can unpack some of it, a little bit of it. And, you know, it is for me, but I'm still thinking about how I can, you know, suggest for everybody else. We all know that we're hurt, but it's a matter of that we think we're handling that hurt. Like we actually thought we were putting the mask on and breathing, but clearly we aren't. <laughs> so. Oh, that is a really good point. And it brings back that idea of community, right? Of it takes everyone, it has to be in this within the systems, that idea of self-care, that it's not a workshop. Oh, it's not this spa day. It's built into the systems that, people do not get to the point of needing a mask or the resenting part of the work. Um, that eventually, right, in their systems in place and power dynamics and depending on who's coming where, you have from inequalities and racial and social class and who gets hard, who gets the resources, right? The, that story or analogy of black ants and red ants in a jar when you put them in there and leave them alone they actually all get along and they're just fine and if you shake the jar they start fighting so they they word was that they they can't get along but really it's because the pressure of shaking this jar we all attack whoever's closest to us and so you find that either the organizations they're all trying to do the same thing but now it feels like scarcity mentality. There's not enough resources. So then the lawyers are getting mad at the social workers and the social workers are resenting the, <laughs> the whoever is closest to you or safe enough to, or we take it home, like Crystal was saying. Um, yes, I'm by using that story of the parent gets home and takes it out on the kid and the kid takes it out on the pet and the pet takes it, you know, the dog takes it out on the cat. Everybody finds where their power is and safety and we take it out on the partners. But really the question should be who's shaking the jar and where should our energy be that we all support each other to do this work well, right? Um, so that's a really great, great point of how do we also change the systems that they support the supporters, they heal the healers um, and both and, and then how do we do that for ourselves? Because until that happens on a higher level, we also have to do the daily things that it doesn't impact our social um, spaces. Okay. Anybody else before I move on? I don't want to, I love hearing other voices in the room and all kinds of um, experiences and interrupt me at any time. It doesn't have to be when I pause. Okay. Okay. So some of those words and terminology we just went over, how does that actually look like in our bodies, in our day-to-day, -day, what's happening? Um, I think some of you might be familiar with that book and I'm looking over there because I don't, The Body Keeps the Score, where that no, whether or not we are engaging with the trauma we're experiencing or hearing, the body actually knows what we're going through. And that's when people have migraines that never go away and they don't know why. I don't know. I just always had this or back pain, neck pain, or full on um, heart issues. And it's all stress or accumulation of all this um, difficult work. So when we ignore the brain trying to tell us do something, do something, it's like, I know what you're going to listen to. Nobody's going to ignore headache. Nobody's going to ignore back pain when you can't sit or stand. Um, and, and for me, if I've been traveling, not sleeping well, I don't know. Everybody has their own. So take a moment to, to know what what is your indicator when, when that check service light comes on in your body? Like, what are those pieces for you? For me, I get a cold right away. If I go three days without eight hours of sleep, I first piece is a cold and I get a migraine. And at one time, I ignored it long enough during grad school, I actually got vertigo. I ended up in the ER. I had no idea what was going on. They couldn't find anything. And eventually they were like exhaustion. I was going from time zone to time zone with three kids in grad school and thinking I can save the world and do it all, superwoman. And now I'm like, that is actually no longer. Uh, it is not a compliment anymore when people are like, oh, you're such a wonder woman. How do you do it all? And we're like, hey, hey, yeah, that's me. Now I'm like, oh God, I need to look at something here. 
because that is not sustainable in our bodies, our minds, our hearts deserve better than that. And they need to be on that top five list. Okay, I digress. So back to how, what is your stress response? We all have different ones. I was sharing mine so that you also get a moment to reflect or even write it down. So you remind yourself, what is yours? What, when is that, when is your body telling you you're doing too much? Um, right, so when those triggers have happened, right? Some of the ways we get impacted, heart rate, blood pressure changes, digestion shuts down immune system shuts down, logical thinking brain goes offline. I'm going to say more about this, but these are the stress responses that help us survive in times of crisis. But our brains, as incredible as they are, they are also primitive in a way that they are only really good. The brain is only concerned about two things, first and foremost. Safety, are you safe? But it only gets this information bottom up. It only gets that information in a sense of the same way you would run into a lion. How you'd respond is exactly how it responds when you're in front of a stressor, in front of somebody who is angry. So, oh, we got people coming in. All right. So this is the the model I want us to to think about as I'm getting into this part of the lecture piece. Is that we're gonna pretend that's the brain, this part on the left right here. In the front, that's your prefrontal cortex where your logical thinking brain is. The thumb, so if you do it yourself this way, the thumb is your amygdala. That's where it, the emotional brain, that's where it keeps all memories of the emotions, where you are heart, where you are, all of it is right here. And then this bottom part, which is back here, it is your survival brain. That's the emergency response. So think of if uh, somebody who broke your heart in kindergarten and their name was, I don't know, say Johnny. And then all these years later, you're an adult and your boss's name is Johnny. And you like, I don't know why I don't like this person. They've not done anything. Or you smell something and you got sick from shrimp one time and now you're like, never again. And you smell it and right away. That's your amygdala. It's like your, um, what is that thing called? The uh, oh, smoke detector. <laughs> I was having a little uh, freeze moment. Smoke detector, It's it will go off because it's detecting something there. It, that, it's not necessarily saying there's a fire. It's just saying something to look into, right? That's your amygdala. And so when we've been traumatized, it's every time, let's say you left something on the stove a little too long or you're frying something and you, you're actually there and the smoke detector goes off because you know that it's not a fire. Most of us would just walk over there, maybe blow on it or turn the things off, open a window, right? But when we've been really traumatized or triggered, every time it goes off, this is telling our brain that the house is on fire and we grab everything we need and run or we freeze, right? So every time your smoke detector going off, you're doing this and that's exhausting. So when that happens, it flips the lid as the Dr. Siegel calls it. And when it does that, you're no longer accessing your logical brain to say, oh no, it's just the smoke, I can open a window. You're no longer accessing this that can kind of go through, what do I need to do, right? So think of the last time you had a really intense fight with anyone and then you walk away after that, it's like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that. Oh, this would have been a better comeback. Or I wish I didn't say that because you're actually not connected here anymore. So most of those really terrible decisions we make out of activation or anger is because we're not connected. So that little tool of five senses or taking a breath is your actual reminder or telling the brain, no, we're safe. We don't have to run. There's no fire. Like, come back down. And then we can really think, what do we need to do? So I don't know if that makes sense, right? So anytime, and I teach this to everyone. I've taught it to my kids. And uh, sometimes I regret it. So teaching your kids what you think they should do versus what you actually do. So when I'm going off, like, oh my God, 
and I'm screaming and they're like mom we think your brain is like this <laughs> what, what do you need to bring it back here and I'm like oh gosh <laughs> like I'll show you a brain like this no I'm kidding <laughs> But they keep us humble. <laughs> they remind us what we need to do, what we preach versus what we practice. So anytime we can come back in and like, okay, am I am I right here? You can take a breath when you are um, activated, a deep breath. So that tells the brain we're safe. Calm down. We will do this, and then we can make uh, better decisions of what's coming up for us. And so when it's like this. This is automatic for us. And again, some of you know this very well, and I apologize that you're going through it again, but maybe think of it in that in a more personal way versus a more of the people you support. Um, when it, It's like this. You only have four options, and you don't choose them. <laughs> the brain chooses for you. And that's why when you see uh, survivors of sexual assault blaming themselves, like, why did I freeze? Like you didn't choose that. The brain had to decide which one is going to be more likely to help you to survive. Its only job, first job is to help you to survive. Job number two is efficiency. That's why we categorize things. That's where stereotypes come in. The brain is like, well, we're gonna compartmentalize. What do we need to know so we can get to this thing faster? Oh. All right, so it decides in a very quick moment, can I fight this person? Yes or no? Can I flee successfully? Yes or no? Can I freeze? This obviously happens much faster than I'm talking. And then if nothing else, the appease or fawn, if we want to stay with the Fs. This is one that is not usually incorporated in a lot of uh, when we say fight, flight, freeze, fawn. But this is more common than we realize. This is when you start doing everything. This, the people pleasing part of trauma response is also, if I do what they want at any time, I'm safe. Again, the only intention for the brain is safety. It's keeping me safe by doing these terrible things or by doing things I don't want to do. I'm exhausted and I'm going to keep saying yes to one more project, to one extra hour, to one more thing. Because sometimes the brain is saying, what happens if you say no based on all our experiences? All right. So like I said, most of us think and we try to solve from top down. We think we're being logical because we have all this knowledge and experience and wisdom. But the moment we're activated or something is happening for us, where our brain actually takes information from bottom up at all times. It starts off by, am I safe? What do I need to do to be safe? What, what is the alarm telling me? And then by the time it makes it up here, this is what makes us different from other animals. This is what makes us special as humans is because we have that prefrontal cortex that can do that work so the same way we get information bottom up it's the same way we have we can bring ourselves calm ourselves down it also has to start from bottom up right starts from taking that breath versus thinking your way out of a problem how many of us have oh just walk it off your anxiety will go away um your, your panic attack should just subside because you're you're aware and you know this you've got the skills it all has to start this way, the way it takes that in. So I know that was a lot too, but like we have 90 minutes today, 90 minutes on Friday. This could all take three days sometimes. So I'm going to pause here and check in. Well, if any of that, any questions, did that make sense? How does that show up for you? And maybe a quick breath all together of getting that sense of bottom up, this Breathing in deeply and then letting it out really slow. And that's an actual message to the brain. It's like, I'm safe, we're okay. And usually they say three breaths to, to move the nervous system all the way back to the parasympathetic part of it. The calm, like it's always doing the dance. So, okay, maybe I needed that. I feel like I was talking a lot and fast. So. Any questions, comments, experiences with this, maybe with people you've worked with yourself? Does that make sense? Anything I can say more about? Floor is yours. And chat too, for those who can't talk.
All right. So I guess I was really clear. That's great. Um, oh, I see a message. <clears throat> Other techniques to calm the brain? Well, I am glad you asked, Cindy. That's actually what's next. <laughs> and then before we do that, actually, um, I also wanted to... Okay, do we have time? No, 15 more minutes. All right, I'm going to... I'll... You, you received an email this morning from Ansley, and it has a wellness... Uh, plan piece. So I don't want to forget this. That's going to be your homework. Going through that, um, because you have so much time, right? You you, you need more things to do on your to-do list. So. <laughs> but remember, you're on top. You're number one on that list. So this is for you. Um, that is a quick PDF of checking in for yourself. When to know, when am I doing well? When am I not? What are the cues? Body, how we talk, how we dress, all of that. So you don't have to type it in. You don't have to turn it in. It's just for your own. And then sometimes for those who want to, even sharing it with a partner, with a friend, with a sister, with a coworker, as a group of when you start seeing me show up in black, you can start asking questions, right? So I'm saying some things, how we dress that day, sometimes it's an indicator. Um, I'm saying that as my own example, I usually wear a lot of bright colors. So I'm like, when I see myself not caring anymore, I'm like, oh, something is up. So that will be your, your um, homework. So next week we will jump into more of coping resource, coping or resourcing and long-term and all of that. Um, because Cindy asked more, more skills or more tools. I, I wanted to frame that for next week or help you return. So we'll do a lot more then. This was kind of, more of trying to do both and. And then I will teach you one more before we go. But before that, do a quick exercise. Um, I want you to take this moment and everybody has something in front of them. What? Um, take a second and touch something with your hand. Touch something. All right. Everybody touch something? Just touch it. Good. Now pretend that that hand that you just used is not there. You don't have that anymore. And I want you to touch that same thing again. The same exact thing, I want you to touch it. Okay. Either unmute or in a chat, what did you use to touch it again? What did you do? I did touch the mouse. <laughs> what, you used your what? Sorry. My hands to touch the mouse. Okay. And when, when your hands went away, what did you use? My mouth. Oh, your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Ah, oh, Ansel used the opposite hand. <laughs> I guess I didn't say both are gone. <laughs> so there you go. Um, who else? What else was used? Others just didn't do it. You, you were like, no, can't touch it now. I just used the opposite hand. You use the opposite yeah, hand? The opposite hand, yeah. Interesting. And I think I saw Cindy use his, her elbow. Yeah, oh. okay. <laughs> Any other cool ways you touched the same thing? Or different ways? You can share in the chat. All right. Um, so everybody came up with a different way. Mouth, elbow other hand um some people one person that was the only time I've heard that is like I used my eyes it's like oh okay well that's cool like I just saw it and feel like I'm touching it but I was like right so what is that for around resilience when we're doing this work a lot of things are thrown at us things are taken away we all experience COVID I mean we're here because of COVID you know, most of us in a million years would never have been doing virtual stuff like this. Like, oh, I can't go. It's not happening. And when we're doing this work, we, and I think Shay, you mentioned starting poetry and you didn't know that was a thing. But when we think of resilience, most people have talked about resilience as this bouncing back, like the palm tree and 
the storm comes and it bends and then the storm goes away and it just boom right back on but we know that the things and the people the things people have gone through that you experience on a daily basis you don't bounce back when you're in a new country. You don't bounce back when they throw you on a bus and drive you across the country and you don't speak the language and you don't have a house. And that's, you cannot bounce back, right? But we get creative. We get, um, we find ways to do things that we could no longer do the same way we used to do them. And everybody has a different way of coming at that, as you noticed in this room, right? And not everybody shared how they did it, but it's like, okay, now I'm going to use my elbow because I don't have hands versus, well, I guess that ends there. I can't exist anymore because I don't have the hands. And that is same for us. Sometimes resilience will look like I'm going to take a day off and eat a bucket of ice cream and watch Netflix all day <laughs> or I'll curl up in my bed and actually cry for the first time in how many years or it is I'm going to whatever it is is it can't come up for us until we actually go in of what do I need right what can I do differently since this is not working? So when you are seeing on that wellness plan, something is not working. My body is telling me something is off. It's not failure that we don't bounce back and show up at 100% the next day or I go to a spa and I'll, all of a sudden, I'm, it's what do I need and how can it be done? It might be differently than how I've always done it. It might be less than, right? Some days are going to be 50%. But when we resist looking at why do I need and how do I need to do it, we end up kind of killing ourselves thinking we, we get in that spiral, right? That uh, moral injury, that shame of, oh, now I'm supporting less people than I used to. I'm exhausted, all whatever that is for you. So rem reminding yourself that you have what it takes. I think it's a Nigerian proverb that says, the hand knows where the mouth is, even in the darkest time. And that's to say that you can always, we can all always find our mouth to feed ourselves, even when we don't have light. It means that we have within us, we know how to heal ourselves. We know what we need, but we just don't always tap into that. And so this is that call to action. When you're doing your wellness is what do I need and how does it need to happen? That you don't, we don't bounce back. That's a myth. We change. We evolve, right? It, some things grow, some things come to pass and all of that. And so wanting to end with that last skill, a uh, tool, not skill, um, that you asked for. Well, it's here somewhere. So this is called tracking. And this will help us to, to kind of remind ourselves to do that those kinds of questions on a daily basis. Um, and it's called tracking because we are tracking how we're feeling in different parts. And this, I love this tool so much because it separates the different parts of us that we usually, oops, supposed to be sharing. Okay. Oh, all right. So we're going to to um, think about the mind, the, the mind, the mind, <laughs> the body, and the heart. Um, and as we're doing this, I'm it'll be more like a little guided uh, grounding, and you'll be coming up with a number from one to ten. One being not where I want to be, ten being perfection. And perfection is only based on you. There's no perfection global scale of that. Um, and then five is neutral. So you'll be fine getting that number in your mind for yourself. And then um, we'll come back together or you can share if you feel like you want to share. But the reason tracking is uh, important is that mind, body, heart, they all kind of work together, but they're also very separate and different. And most of us, I think you've all heard of the word the kids use of hangry. When you're hungry and you become angry or irritable and it's literally it's just your body saying i need food <laughs> and then the emotion is like ah right so 
they all are interconnected. And in that moment, if you ate, you would not be angry. But if somebody were to say, well, how are you? Why do you care? <laughs> right? Like that's me. Um, or caffeine. So separating it, this tool gives us agency to know that we can change the things, some things we can, we want to change. And also the awareness helps us give ourselves grace by knowing that I'm not in this place. Then I have agency also to either remove myself, breathe. What do I need is the key question here, okay? So if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes depending on where you are. So I saw some people in the car, don't do that. Um, if you are not comfortable, if you want to turn your video off, feel free. If you want to close your eyes or find a place to gaze that is not, if for those who are in a busy space, find a place you can look that you're not distracted. And I'm going to move through it a little faster than what I normally would because we have six minutes and we have places to be. So, but we'll still do what it needs to do. Okay. So do whatever feels good for you that you can be present with yourself closing your eyes, taking this moment to feel your body in the chair, back to those senses, feel your feet touching the ground, getting a sense of where I am, why I'm here is for me to take care of me because I matter. And now I want you to bring your attention to your mind and we'll do one quick deep breath through the nose Hold and let it out really slowly, letting your chair, bed, or wherever you're sitting, do more of the work. Let yourself sink in a little deeper. And now without judgment, bring your attention to your mind. How is my mind? What does it need? Just watch your mind. Is it busy? Be quiet. From a scale of one to ten, one being loud, obnoxious, that's not what I want. Five is neutral, ten is well, whatever that is for you, just where you want it, not necessarily. But we don't have to change or judge, just awareness. So keep that number in your mind. And now we're going to move into the body. Let's do another breath to separate the two. In and letting go. And on the body, bring your attention to your feet on the ground. In every part of the body I mentioned, I want you to just bring your awareness to that part and give it what it needs. Maybe stretch maybe tensing the muscle relaxing so bring your attention to your toes maybe wiggling them to your ankles your legs your knees your thighs maybe tense your muscles and relax to feel the difference your glutes and bottom in the chair your lower back, if it feels good, you can turn around, stretch it a little, going up your spine to your shoulders. Maybe it's helpful to bring them to your ears and let them relax. Your arms, maybe making a fist with your hands and relaxing, rolling your wrists, then the neck, Your face, maybe you can touch it, or jaws, relaxing them. We all hold tension in different places. Maybe your mind's eye, maybe scrunching up your face and letting it relax, or putting a smile on to stretch out the jaws, all the way to the top of your head. So again, without judgment, one to 10, how is my body? And last but not least, it helps to put your hand there on your heart. You can take another breath. 
Let it go. How is my heart? That could be a feeling you're feeling right now. Heavy, lighter, neutral, one to 10. We'll take another breath and letting go. And whenever you're ready, opening your eyes. So, hey, so unfortunately we don't have time to process how everybody's doing or how that went, but you can take that where you are now, whatever number you are, and ask yourself if my body was at a six and I want it to be a seven or eight. If you want it at a six, that's fine. You want it to go up. Like, what does it need? Ask yourself that question for all those parts. My answer is usually a nap or caffeine, but that could be different for you all. And go do that. So the next five minutes before you jump into whatever else is waiting for you, I want you to really really check in what did my body need what does my mind need what does my heart need and go do that and then i'll see you next friday with a little bit more uh, i don't know if ansley you wanted to say something to do but thank you all for your attention oh. your presence and thank great you. i think we need this every monday <laughs> i know <laughs> that's what i was gonna say let's just make this recurring because that was great thank you I see a lot of thank yous and so good very relaxing exercise in the chat so thank you so much we really appreciate um, your perspective your refreshing knowledge and expertise um, all of these fantastic exercises thank you for leading us through them uh, we invite you all to join us on Friday for part two of this I dropped the registration link in the chat and there's been some comments, so scroll up a little bit to find it. And I'm also dropping the registration link for, um, well, this is eligible for continuing education credits if you are a social worker or a mental health practitioner. So um, I am also dropping the registration link for that. So this first part is worth 1.5 um, hours and the second is worth 1.5 hours. So you can earn three in total. So um, just some boring logistics, but wanted to, uh, be sure that we covered those before we went. So we really hope to see everybody on Friday and sincerely thank you, Tabitha, for uh, for joining us and leading us through these exercises. So, all right, Enjoy your thank week, you everyone. Everybody. Thank you, thank you. Have, have a great Bye. week and see you Bye. on Friday. Bye. Take care.